Well, this morning we turn our attention to a different section of scripture. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to take our attention away from the Gospel of John, and we're going to address the topic of racism, more particularly the discernment that you and I should have biblically on the topic of racial divides. So I want you to take your Bibles to begin with and open up with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17. We're going to get uh, settled there this morning, and we're going to come back to that later on in the message. But let me just give you a couple of preliminary words that I think are important for you to understand. As we move through this this morning, there's probably going to be some things that I do not say that you're going to wonder if I'm going to say. And I will say them in the next couple of weeks. So just give me a little time, and I'm sure I will get to them. A lot of what I'm going to do today is lay a foundation for what we're going to address in the next two weeks. But also, I want you to understand that I come here not as a political operative. I do not come here as some kind of sociological representative. I come to you as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I represent God's word to you, not anything else. And I have no desire, frankly, to know anything else. However, I have to tell you that there's a lot of things going on in the world today that have very much affected the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to do my best, as best as I possibly can, to give you biblical discernment in this time in which you and I live. I personally believe that Satan is attacking the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in such a very, very strong way. And I'm just amazed how quickly evangelical churches are capitulating and giving in to the doctrines of men rather than the doctrines of God. So with that said, we're going to turn our attention now to the text and we'll work our way through some of those very important topics this morning. Let me read a few of the verses here in Acts chapter 17. I'm going to read verse 24 through verse 27, I believe it is. Yes, I'll stop at 27 this morning. Acts 17 verse 24, the Bible says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men who dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord and and in hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. In a book entitled One Race, One Blood written by Ken Ham in Answers in Genesis, He says this, and I quote, Racism is a consequence of sin in a fallen world infused with evolutionary thinking. The consequence of racism on a personal and social level are huge, end quote. That statement can be magnified a thousand times over in the last few weeks as a result of what many believe to be a racially motivated murder of George Floyd by officer Derek Chauvin. Floyd's death came six weeks after police in Louisville, Kentucky, fatally shot Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old black woman, during a midnight no-knock raid on her home. It came 10 weeks after the killing of Ahmad Arbery, a 25-year-old black man who was chased down by a white father and son in a pickup truck as he jogged in the neighborhood in Glenn County, Georgia. As a result of that, we've seen riots in the streets, we've seen protests, looting, the burning of buildings, destruction of private property. Men and women, both black and white, have been beaten with two-by-fours, had rocks and bricks and bottles thrown at them. Civilians and police have been shot, murdered, and left to die on the streets, both black and white. Entire city blocks have been taken over in Seattle, Washington, by protesters of the Black Lives Matters group. While demands to these cities are to defund the police department, grow louder and louder, anarchists and terror groups like Antifa have been paid to take advantage of the situation to overthrow the government. Frankly put, it's a nasty situation. Although I do not claim to know what's in the hearts and the minds of the men that have committed the crimes that I speak of, I must confess to you that racism is very bad. Whether it is perceived or real, It can lead to some very deadly and very hurtful consequences and crimes. 
All types of attempts have been made in history to solve the problem of racism or the racial divide here in America. In the 1960s, you had the Civil Rights Movement. Then you had the removal of the laws of segregation. Then you had affirmative action policies. And even with all of this, there's a great deal of pessimism concerning the solving of the racial issues. In a book entitled The End of Racism, The White Man's Burden, the author states, deeply distressed by the continuing failure of blacks as a group to succeed in America, many scholars and social activists allege that all talk of racial progress is an evasion or a mirage. They assume that racism is not a departure from American ideals, but a true expression of them. That the nation's institutions are eradicably tainted with racism, and that racism may be an intricate part of the human, if not at least of the Western psyche, so that we may never be able to transcend it. The dominant view today is that race is a social reality, or as African-American scholar Cornel West put it, race matters. Therefore, the only viable response is to institutionalize race as a basis of public policy. Now, in recent years, literally the last probably five years or so, maybe a little longer, we've seen another attempt to try to eradicate, erase, and to help with the problem of racism. It's the new religion of America. It's called social justice and critical race theory. For those of you who may not be in the know of that or may not have read on that, and honestly, I would be in favor of not having to read any of it personally, but that is the movement today within our culture that is radically transforming the ideology and the thinking of our men and women. Critical race theory really could be summed up by saying that it is the way that explains how racism occurs. Ultimately, it could be summed up with this, is that the white, man is, the white man is the oppressor while the black man is the one who is being oppressed. White supremacy is no longer the burning of a cross on the lawn. It's just anybody who's white in a place of authority or in a business or anything like that. So it tries to explain that. Social justice is the attempt to solve it in a practical way or in a, quote, just way, or as they would claim, a right way. On the surface, it seems rather good, right? I mean, after all, you hear the word social and you hear the word justice, and immediately whenever we as believers or a church hear the word justice, we kind of perk up. We think we, we're in favor of justice. We want what's right. We want what is good for people. We don't want to see injustice. So there's an immediate temptation on the part of the church to kind of give in to this and to get on board of this. We all know that there's racism as it is defined here in America. We all know that there's unequal pay for people who are equally qualified. We know that there's some who don't get the position because maybe they're a woman or maybe because they're black. We all know that's there and we would holler for justice and equality and we would want people to get what is rightfully theirs based upon their qualifications and based upon the fact that they get what is just, right? We all agree with that. But social justice is not always just. In fact, it's justice is actually something that is determined by the group. It may be based upon an absolute, but most times it is based upon subjective reality and justice can be basically whatever the group determines justice to be the ideology of social justice is not new though if you are familiar with history then you'll know that the ideology of social justice comes from marxism it's communist if you just this afternoon have some free time and you want to find out what the basic tenets of social justice is i would encourage you to read a free publication online called the communist manifesto if you just want to read something to start a new country or to oppress people, there are the tenets behind social justice. Marxism basically teaches in its very basic form the redistribution of wealth. Not so much the taking of rich people and giving to poor, but so much so that the, the state, the government, owns everything and then distributes to people equally all that they are supposed to have. Classic communism. Classic approaches to North Korea and other communist states like China in our world today. The social justice philosophy, to understand it basically, you have to look at the two terms. One is justice and one is social. Now, I want you to hang with me. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? The word justice, basically in the context of social justice, means this. To give whatever is fair 
or whatever is right through the distribution of rewards or punishment. All right, you get that? The other social basically means any social group, any social group, whatever that social group may be, can claim a need for justice if they feel like they've been done wrong. Now, you take the groups. It's not individuals anymore. Remember, we're dealing with Marxism and communism, so we're not dealing with individuals and people being promoted based upon their quality. You're promoted based upon what you are, not who you are. And you take the groups today, what basically social justice deals with. It doesn't look at the individual. It looks at the groups. So you can be a black male and be part of a group. You can be a white woman and be part of a group of all white women. You can be a disabled white male and be part of a separate group. You can be a black woman and be a part of a separate group. You can be part of the LGBT community and be part of a large group of people in our culture. And you hear more and more of that. In fact, if you don't know this, the LGBTQ acronym has grown at length. It is now LGBTIQCAPGNGFNBA. Can't say that on news, it's too long. Basically stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, questioning, curious, asexual, pansexual, gender nonconforming, gender fluid, non-binary, and androgynous. Now, you can be part of that group, but you can get a bigger group if you have other characteristics in your group. The groups can be one group, or they can be made up of many others that make up an individual group. And the amount of justice, and this is where it gets really interesting, the amount of justice that you deserve is based upon how many times you intersect certain groups. It's called intersectionality. So the way to explain that is this. If you're a white woman in the workforce, you are due a certain amount of equal pay because you are a white woman. Doesn't matter whether you're qualified or whether you do the job well, because you're a white woman, you get equal pay. But if you're a lesbian white woman, you get double the justice. You get more pay. But if you're a lesbian white woman who's disabled, you got three in your favor, so you get triple the justice. Triple the fair pay. More comes your way in wealth and privilege because of that situation. And they make up all types of groups like that. Now, you take all of that and you apply it to the racism issue today with social justice. And what you end up with basically is this. You have the idea that because you're a certain color and because you're a certain gender and because you're a, sex, a certain sexual orientation, that you are an oppressed group. And because you're an oppressed group, you deserve certain things in the society, no matter if you qualify for them or not. It's just because of who you are in the sense of that group, what you are. So if you're a black man, uh, you're in favor of one justice or one wealth or privilege given to you. If you're a black woman, then you get another. If you're a black woman who's a lesbian, you get two, uh, three actually. You got black woman and then you're a lesbian. But if you're a black woman who's disabled and also you believe climate change has affected you, you get five. The worse off you are, the more you intersect these oppressed groups, the better off you really are. And the more you're to get privilege and wealth, if you will, and position from the society. You say, well, pastor, how does that flesh out in, in reality? Well, listen, we have people in this church that are dealing with this in their workplace right now. It's happening right now as I speak. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a couple of quick examples. First of all, if there's two men who apply for a secular job, one is white, one is black, and the white man may be more qualified than the black, but the black will get the job because he has been oppressed for so long, and it should be the responsibility of the white man to give him some sense of justice and to give him position, even though he is not necessarily qualified for the job. If you take a job where maybe some of you work, and there's someone there who's of the LGBT community, and you decide, because you know the Bible tells you, you should be a witness to them on behalf of Christ, and so you start talking to them about the gospel, and then you bring up the very, very forbidden word, sin, and you say that you're out of step with God, and out of fellowship with God, and you're under the wrath of God, whatever way you want to say it, well, guess what? Your job is gone. You've just lost your job. Because you have oppressed them. You have actually said that they are actually not like normal people. Social justice demands 
that you're fired. No exceptions whatsoever. And this has also crept into the church. This has been the battle for the last couple of years in the church. And if you read any bit on what's going on in the churches, evangelical churches in America, you hear this all the time. It's out there all over the place. There are leading evangelical pastors who have said that if you're seeking to have someone come on your staff as a pastor in a local church and one is black and one is white, if the black man is less qualified, biblically speaking, but the white man is more qualified, hire the black man because of social justice demands so. doesn't matter what God's word says, right? What matters is making sure everybody gets equal based upon what you are rather than who you are and the qualifications. It's totally undermining justice. It totally does away and will, in the end, if it continues on, it will, in the end, destroy our civilization in an attempt to solve racism. This is going a direction, but it's not going a good direction at all. I mean, you look at the way it is today in the world and the way the church deals with racism. They have literally got on board with all of this. Many have gotten on board with this. Now, social justice which was a very simple explanation of what I shared with you this morning regarding that, is the fuel that is firing, firing up Black Lives Matter. Now, I take a risk in addressing this, but I need to address this because you need to have biblical discerning, discernment regarding it. Black Lives Matter is the largest, most powerful movement in recent history and has a claim to extinguish racism from the planet. But most evangelicals do not know and do not have a clue that the agenda and the mission of the Black Lives Matter movement is much, much more than just racism. Their fight for racism is just simply the tip of the iceberg. It's what most people hear about whenever they hear the word Black Lives Matter. But there's much more sinister efforts and much more evil going on in the background. Black Lives Matter was founded in 2013 in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer, Zimmerman. Black Lives Matter is a foundation that's global now. It's in the UK, in Canada, obviously in the United States. In their own website, they state this, that their mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes. Now, you need to understand the way they use the word white supremacy is different than the way it used to be used. As I said earlier, it's not the burning of the cross on the front lawn. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about anybody who's white who's in a position of, of authority over a black person. That's white supremacy. And so their desire is to eradicate that, to completely do away with that. They were enraged with the death of Trayvon, uh, Trayvon Martin. And because of the subsequent acquittal of George Zimmerman, it inspired, in that case, in Florida, the takeover of the state Florida Capitol by Power U and the Dream Defenders. A year later, there was another incident that occurred that Black Lives Matter was involved in, in Ferguson. If you remember that, in the news a few years ago, it was because of Michael Brown's murder, as they would claim by the police department. This has forever changed the way things are approached in our culture regarding this. Ferguson really, and the events of Ferguson, helped accelerate the movement. In their own words, because of what they are and what they have become, they have been able to oust anti-black politicians, they've won critical legislation to benefit black lives, and have changed the terms of the debate on blackness around the world. They said in their own website that we see ourselves as part of a global black family. Now, some of that stuff you hear probably is no big deal. You think, well, that's nothing wrong with that. I mean, after all, they're just trying to make sure that they're taken care of and they're not done wrong. And I would have no problems with that if that's all it was. But that is not all that it is, folks. In fact, reading from their own website, their own information, it says this, and I quote, We are guided by the fact that all black lives matter, regardless of actual perceived sexual identity, gender identity, or gender expression, economic status, ability, disability, religious belief, or disbelief, immigration status, or location. We make space for transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. We are self-reflexive and, and do the work required to dismantle, let me reread that again, 
we are self-reflexive and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege. That's normal people, sexually normal people, cisgender. And to uplift black trans folks, especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by the trans antagonistic violence. Then comes this statement. We disrupt, from their own website, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure required by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. I don't know if you notice there's a word missing there. Fathers. They're not there at all. Fathers are gone. It goes on in the website and says, we foster a queer-affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather, the belief that all in the world is heterosexual. Their goal, basically, is to undo the family, to destroy what we call the normal biblical family. The three founders, which were three radical black women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Apal Tomiti, Alicia Garza is a feminist and a self-described Marxist. She's also a queer social justice activist. In 2008, she married her husband, Malachi Garza, who's a transgender male activist. Put that all together. She's the one who's credited with coming up with the term Black Lives Matter. In 2013, after the acquittal of George Zimmerman, she tweeted out, or actually put on her Facebook account, Black people, I love you, I love us, our lives matter, Black Lives Matter. From there came the statement, Black Lives Matter. Patrice Cullors is the second lady in the group that was part of the founding movement of the Black Lives Matter. She's a self-proclaimed feminist. She also says she was forced out of her home at the age of 16 because she came forward or came out with her queer identity. She was involved in the Jehovah Witness religion, but became disillusioned with the church, eventually giving herself over to a Nigerian religious tradition. She told an interviewer, the most important thing is, as a queer black woman, to order in order to truly understand how devastating and widespread this type of violence is in black America, we must view this epidemic through the lens of race, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Opal Tomiti is a transnational feminist. Whatever that is, I guess you go everywhere being a feminist. In 2015, Garza and the two other women were founded, who founded Black Lives Matter were runners-up for the Advocates Persons of the Year Award. In 2016, the trio were added to the Fortunes Magazine's 50 Most Influential World Leaders. Black Lives Matter is inherently a movement sustained by political blackness, according to their own words. Charlene Caruthers reminded us of these words. They are unapologetically feminist, womanist, and queer. I'll add my thoughts. They are communist, Marxist, revolutionaries, and anti-Christ. The socialist movement, Black Lives Matter, is committed to these demands. Full employment and housing, free college, end of voter ID laws. Why would you need that, right? The release of all U.S. political prisoners, defunding the police department, Collective ownership of everything. Although the movement has seen, been seen primarily as a cry against racism, racism is only a very, very small part of the movement. Its desire literally is to undo and destroy the very fabric of the United States of America. This is not a small matter at all. One black congressman has labeled them a terrorist group. It is antithetical to the Bible. It is ungodly, unchristian. And one more thing. Although the Black Lives Matter claims that all black lives matter, yet no attempt has been made, no words have been given, no protest has been conducted, no defunding has been demanded of the number one killer of black people in America, and that's Planned Parenthood. In fact, the opposite is true. Planned Parenthood supports Black Lives Matter, and Black Lives Matter accepts Planned Parenthood's support. 
In their own words, on their own website, Planned Parenthood says, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, and Tony McDade, we say these names today because we remember the names of so many more in hope that their lives have not been forgotten. Black lives matter. Their deaths must be answered with swift justice and reformative action. The fundamental right to bodily autonomy, the belief that every person should be safe and free in their own body, guides Planned Parenthood's work and our fight for reproductive freedom. State-sanctioned violence makes the promise of freedom unattainable for black people in this country and includes reproductive freedom. If black people do not have bodily autonomy necessary to live their daily lives or protest the violence against their lives without the fear of violence or murder, we can never truly achieve reproductive freedom or justice. Let me reread that and add a biblical framework to this. It says, if black people do not have bodily autonomy necessary to live their daily lives or protest the violence against their lives without the fear of violence or murder, we can never truly achieve the ability to be free to kill our children. Planned Parenthood Advocacy Fund stands in solidarity with the black community, as they say, and we join them in demanding justice and accountability. Well, where is justice and accountability for the many who have been killed? And the abortion clinics, nobody says a word about that. There's no protest on the streets regarding that. If anything, it's like, let's support it. The hypocrisy is so thick. Black women make up 14% of the childbearing population, yet 36% of all abortions in America are obtained by black women. It's at a ratio of 474 to a thousand births. In other words, for every thousand births, nearly half of those births are aborted. I was told by the men who in our church go down to the abortion clinic here in Columbia that the majority of the women coming to the clinic are black. Where is the outcry for that? Where is the protest for that? Where is all the demand to make sure that we defund Planned Parenthood? Where is that? Behind the scenes of this fight for racial justice is literally the complete destruction of the biblical family and society as we know it. Yet, the church, many in the church and parachurch organizations are willing to join with them and fight racial injustice. And literally by their mere association with Black Lives Matter, what they're doing is undermining the very message that could change the situation. The gospel of Christ. The idea was expressed with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, who said these words, and I quote, InterVarsity does not endorse everything attributed to Black Lives Matter, but that the ministry is nevertheless co-belligerence with the movement with which we sometimes disagree because we believe it is important to affirm that God created our black brothers and sisters. Listen, I do not need Black Lives Matter to help me tell you that God created all people, black or white. Why can't we, why can't we as Christians just say, look, I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I represent his kingdom. The king is coming back. And therefore, I tell you that God created you in his image. I don't need any other group. And I definitely don't need other groups that are clearly antithetical to what the scripture says. The problem is not so much that the church believes that it shouldn't stand against prejudice, they do. And I, and I understand that. We should. We should be the first voice that stands up against racism and prejudice and the kind of movements that we see against people today. But what do we do? Usually we're kind of coming behind. We jump on board all these other movements that literally do not have the power of the gospel in them. As one author said, too often the church feels the need to stand with those groups or movements that are clearly antithetical to Christianity, yet because it has denied the power of the gospel and embraced the power of pragmatism, it believes that the power is in the numbers. The church has done this for years. For years it's been doing this. In fact, you could go all the way back to the time whenever you have... Uh, the union between the uh, church and the Roman Catholic Church, the evangelical church and the Roman Catholic Church for the topic of abortion. And so many strong, prominent, well-known evangelicals signed on board this idea that we should join hands with the Roman Catholic Church to fight abortion. And behind all of that is the pragmatism that if we do this, we'll have the power of politics, we'll have the power of numbers, and we can overdo what the devil has done. 
When in fact, the way you deal with the devil is through the power of the gospel of Christ. I hate to say, I hate to say this, and I don't want to be pessimistic, but we've lost our way. We've lost our way. It seems more and more that the church decides to become socially active and stand against the evils of society, whether it be racism or abortion or homosexuality or the destruction of the family, the faster it divorces itself from the very power that saves. I want to take you to a text. Look over with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I read this last Sunday and I thought I would go back to it. In fact, I'll be honest with you, this week I spent 10 hours on this text. I dissected it, parsed every verb, looked at every noun, was going to preach this entire text, and then set it aside. That's not the one I need to deal with. That's not the one I need to approach. But I'm going to pick out a couple of things here that I think are important for us to note. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Let's look at a couple of the verses here, just a couple. First of all, note verse 1. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. The word translated here, know this, is an imperative. It's a command. He's telling Timothy, Paul is, he's commanding him to know this. Some translations use the word realize this. It's the idea of understanding this, ascertaining this. Come to grips with this, Timothy, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, for those of you who are more eschatologically uh, astute, you may think that the word last days always refers to the event right before the time of Christ. But actually, biblically speaking, the word last days is the time from the ascension of Christ all the way to the time whenever he does return. We know that from a number of verses. I'll just read one, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, that in these last days he's spoken to us by his son, who he appointed as heir of all things. So the last days started with Jesus Christ coming. And ascending back to heaven. These last days, the last days before he comes, which now has been over 2,000 years, is going to be the time that these perilous times come. And the word perilous means basically hard, uh, troublesome. The word is also translated fierce, hard to bear. There's a couple of times the actual word is translated violent. It's used one other time in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Listen to this verse. When he had come out of the other side to the country of the Gadarenes, there met him... Two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly violent. That's the word. Or fierce. These perilous times are not sugar-coated days. These are not pretty days. These are very difficult times. And the word times helps us to understand exactly what Paul means by that. He uses the word here, kairos, not chronos. Chronos means chronological time, the time of the hours and the minutes and the days ticking forward. That's not the word that he uses. He uses the word kairos, which means epics, seasons of time. And so he's saying that these times are going to come. They're not always going to be with us at every given moment, but they're going to come as seasons, just like the seasons come in our our yearly calendar. There's going to be times when it's a whole lot worse than it is at other times. And I don't know if you realize this, at least I see this in my own short lifetime, that these times have gotten worse, haven't they? They seem to get much more violent, much more anti-God, anti-Christ. And we're living in the midst of one of those perilous times. He says that that time will come. He doesn't use the common word for come, erkomai, to come from one place to another or to arrive. He uses the word that means to be present, to set in. It's like the idea that this bad time comes and it sets in for a while. That's where we are, aren't we? We're right there. We're in one of these perilous times but notice the two things that he begins with we're not going to go through all the characteristics of these bad times but the first two really sum up the rest of them he says first of all men and there's the word anthropon which is mankind all of men men and women and children frankly uh, will be lovers of themselves now you could stop right there and let's just sum it up and go home that's it lovers of themselves it's one word in the greek language and it simply means an auto lover. 
You love yourself. It's all about you. Self-loving would be another way of translating that. It, one lexicon said it describes someone preoccupied with their own selfish desires. Pretty clear about our culture, isn't it? Self-lovers. That, that, is the, that is the basis upon which all these other vices and evils come from. You already have an evil heart. You already have a corrupt mind, a sinful mind, and then you add to that absorption of self and love of self, and out of that comes anything that doesn't satisfy me, anything that doesn't give me what I want, anything that doesn't satisfy my earthly desires, fleshly desires, lust, or whatever, then I'm going to do whatever I need to get it. And the rest of the text tells us what they'll do. But the next one is indicated here in the text. It says they are a lover of money. Like I said, those two things by themselves sum up the reason why you have the rest of the list. You have the lover of self and then the lover of money. The word phil argus is the word the lover of silver. It's two words, to love silver. And the idea literally is to have such a love and affection for money. And you know what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.10, that the root of all evil is what? The love of money. Not money, but the love of money. And so people want material things. They want position. They want power. They want money. They want to satisfy themselves. And we've seen that in full display in the last few weeks with the riots and the looting, men and women, black and white, in complete rebellion against anything that God says in his word, but completely fulfilling the lust of their heart because they love themselves. It's been magnified, of course, by four restraints being removed. Now, if you didn't have a chance, I would encourage you to listen to the message that I sent out this past week by John MacArthur. You need to go back and look at it at his website on the reason for the riots. And in that, he actually mentions the four restraints that have been removed that have caused the situation we're in today. Listen, we didn't just show up here yesterday. Like, the day before, we were biblically centered, that we were biblically mindset, that we had a biblical worldview, and then all of a sudden, the next day, everything goes awry. No. We've been working on this for some time. We've been planting this for a while. We've been fertilizing the fuel for a long time. And now we're beginning to see it. And the sad reality is, is that much of the solution that they are proposing from the secular community and the political world is going to add more fuel to the fire. It will not help it at all. Those four restraints that he mentioned were conscious. The conscience is gone because it's not informed by the word of God. You have to have the word of God to inform your conscience. Children literally are not being taught the word of God. They don't even know what the Bible says. The Ten Commandments are divorced from our culture. It's gone. So children are being raised literally with no boundaries, no fences, no way to know to stop. And they keep going. Then you have parental restraint. The very problem where families literally have fallen apart. Father and mother are not at home if sometimes just the mother's there, father's gone, he doesn't care about the children. And so there's no raising of the children within the confines of the biblical standard of mother and father. That's all been shot to kaput. And then you have government restraint, which is being systematically removed in many ways and will get worse. There's going to be a whole lot more of that. You have people that are put in prison for literally years and years and years and years instead of being dealt with on a very simple, straightforward basis which is the biblical approach in many cases. Then you have the church. The church's restraint is gone. The church has lost its voice. The, the church, listen, it's, it's like the world now. You can go in most churches today and you'll hear very little about the word of God, very, very little about scripture. You'll, have, you'll hear some, some platitudes and a few verses sprinkled in here and there, but most of the time it's all about you and to help you out in your life. And there's going to be a whole lot of that going on in the next few weeks with the topic of racism, how to deal with it in your life, how to approach it in your life, how do you handle it in your workplace, all of these things that are psychobabble in many cases, and many of them aren't even biblical. My goal is, is to speak on the issue in a little bit different way. I'm going to try to approach it from the standpoint of what John the Baptist would do. I'll leave you to think about that. So whenever I come to this text, I, I think about those restraints that have literally been removed, and that has just added serious fuel to the problem. It says if all the fences have been removed and men and women and young people and children are allowed to run rampant, fulfilling all of their evil desires and passions, many of them using the topic of racism just to fulfill that. 
Stealing a flat screen TV has nothing to do with racism. Burning down a Wendy's has nothing to do with racism. But they believe that that's going to accomplish the purpose. If it gets the attention, sure, it gets attention. But again, it, it, it divorces yourself from the very argument. It divorces yourself from the reality of the truth of Scripture. There's one other point I want to make about this passage, and that's in verse 5 of 2 Timothy 3. And I thought this really caught my eye as I moved through it and studied through this passage. And uh, I've read it hundreds of times, but I began to think about this because a lot of this problem that you see listed here in 2 Timothy 3 has to do with the reality of this verse. That it says they have a form of godliness, but deny its power from such people turn away. Now, that's not saying that every single person, every single man, every single woman is in the case of these verses. It's a, it's a look at all of humanity, all of culture at that time as perilous times move forward. And then he's simply saying some of our men, some of our mankind, if you will, will have a form of godliness, but they will deny its power. And that basically means they will have a form of Christianity, a form of, quote, purity or holiness or affirmation of some religion, but they will deny the very power there. And I thought to myself, what exactly is he talking about denying the power? What power is he talking about? Well, just looking at the actual context of the passage, the denying of the power really has to do with the denial of the truth. And not just any truth, but the truth specifically of Scripture. For instance, in the text, if you'll look at it with me, a couple of verses, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7 says that these same ones, these same men are of the sort, verse 6 says, that are always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then verse 8 says, they resist the truth. In verse 10, he says, you've carefully followed my doctrine, which is the truth. Verse 13 says that these are deceived and being deceived in regards to what? The truth. Verse 14 says that you have learned and been assured of what? The truth. He calls the truth in verse 15, the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation. He calls all scripture the very breath of God in verse 16. He says in verse uh, 2 of chapter 4 that you are to preach the word, which is another way of saying preach the truth. He also says in verse 3 of that same chapter that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, which means they will not endure the truth of the scriptures, but they will heap to themselves teachers turning their ears away from the what? The truth. You see, what you have here is a society that's de 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 miss dismissed the truth of Scripture. It's denied the Word of God on many fronts. And the church is doing exactly the same thing. We've seen this in the history of the church with sacramentalism, rationalism, ecumenism, subjectivism, experientialism, mysticism, pragmatism. And now you have the pragmatism that is fleshed out through social justice. That's what the church has adopted now. Let's not, hey, we don't need the Holy Spirit. Who needs the word of God? I've got social justice and critical race theory. I mean, that was why it was so upsetting to see in the last year, not this year, but the last year, whenever the Southern Baptist Convention adopted as Resolution 9 critical race theory. And they say, well, it's just an analytical tool. We're just going to look at people through it. You don't need to look at people through that. I can tell you everything you need to know about racism, hatred, prejudice. I can tell you everything you need to know from the book called the Bible, the truth. Because there's only one, there's only one who can get into the heart of man and knows what's in the heart of man. And that's God. And we have literally divorced ourselves from that. And we have adopted the philosophies of men. I reread a passage over in Colossians that talks about that we are to be aware, beware of the philosophies of men, the traditions of men. Listen, Paul wasn't talking in a vacuum. It was going on in his day. It's going on in our day. They look at the book, the Bible that we have here, and they say, you know what, it's really good. It's got some good historical stuff in it. It's got some good doctrine that really is helpful and helps us to get to heaven. But it's just not practical to deal with this. I mean, this thing's way too complicated. Way too complicated. It's not complicated, folks. It's evil hearts with hatred in it. That's all it is. It's evil hearts with hatred. If you want to use the term racism, we'll get into that later on, of what it really is. It could be defined biblically as murder. Hatred of the heart. 
Thomas Sowell wrote these words I thought was an interesting look into our culture right now. He said this, and I quote, Have we reached the ultimate stage of absurdity, where some people are held responsible for things that happened before they were born, while other people are not held responsible for what they themselves are doing today? Isn't that what it is? Do you realize that Christianity today, which has been liberal for some time, but published an article that churches are to pay reparations? For what? Listen, Ezekiel tells us in chapter 18 that you and I are responsible for our sin, not everybody else's. I'm not responsible for your sin. I'm not responsible for what my grandfather did 100 years ago. I'm only responsible for me. When I stand before the Lord, I'm not going to stand there with grandpa and great-grandpa and somebody else. It's going to be me by myself and every sin that I had in my heart, if it was not dealt with, with the blood of Christ, of course, I'm going to be accountable for that. And so it is the case here with this. We have this, it's, it's going completely nuts. I mean, I am, I, I've, I've reached a point where I'm not even shocked anymore. Uh, there's another one. According to politicians, looting is not violence. It's just the expression of yourself. Wow, that's enlightening, isn't it? According to the social justice warrior, sin is not sin anymore. It's the expression of yourself. And listen to this, according to critical race theory, Racism is the original sin of America. And by the way, only white people can commit it. Black people cannot commit racism, according to critical race theory. Well, you see, whenever you do that, you literally eliminate the basis for the foundation of the gospel. Listen, everybody's a sinner. No, not everybody. Not everybody. Not everybody's sin like that. You destroy the very foundation of the gospel itself. The logic of this is that we don't need to preach the gospel to the oppressed because they are victims. You are the oppressor as a white man, so therefore you have no right to speak into my life. This was expressed last week in Twitter, believe it or not, the foundational format for all philosophical discussion. A woman on Twitter said these words. I saw it myself. Christians, she says, do not treat the protesters as a new mission field. Do not go to love on people or to lead people in prayer. Do not go there to be a Christian voice in the crowd or share God's love, or to be a witness to people. Go there to fight systemic racism and racial violence. The end. Phil Johnson, who's not usually one who mixes his words, or varnishes his words would be a good way of saying it, he says, so apparently you can't do social justice and evangelism at the same time. It's called white saviorism. You have arrived to save the day. It's patronizing and unhelpful. Now, he went on to say, think about the implications of this, where this is going. Where will this go? Listen, you can't talk to me about Christ and the gospel. I already have my Savior. And I don't have any sin, by the way. This is very, very serious. I cannot express to you how serious this is. It is very complicated and can be very, very complicated if you read into it and listen to it a great deal. But I'll tell you the truth. It is clearly from hell. It's from hell. It's being embraced by the church more than ever now. It's not just academic anymore. It's not just a political ideology. It's not just something in the universities and the seminaries. Now you see it expressed in protest and looting and violence. And demands are made. Demands for reparations. Demands for history to be removed and statues to be torn down. And forgiveness is completely obliterated. It's not even possible. And homage is to be expected. That's why I called it the new religion. It's the new religion of America. But this is, for so many in the church, the means to solve the problem. This is what they say solves the problem. This is where we go. I read an article this past week that really gives you an insight on where our problems are regarding this. And it said this. This was the title of the article. To fight racism, stop trying to fix people. Fix the system that supports racism. Now, the article was right in the sense that it addressed some very serious situations where black people had been wrongly arrested by some very corrupt police officers. There's no doubt about that. That was clear. But it's fundamentally flawed in the fact that it's not the system that's the problem. It's the people in the system. They have evil hearts. You can change the building, change the system, and you're still going to have racism in the heart. 
The heart has to be dealt with. Jeremiah said it like this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Listen, all we're doing right now is addressing the outside symptom. We're addressing the problem, not the root. We're not addressing the real issue. Now, to look at what the real issue is, you have to look at what the Bible says. If you want to find out what the solution is, you have to literally look at what the Bible says. And the Bible teaches us a number of things about race and what some call racism. And there's four points that I want to share with you. Not this morning. But I just want to just highlight. I got five more minutes, I think. I want to highlight the first point. The four points are this. What is the biblical view of race? Second, what is the biblical view of racism? Third, what is the biblical solution to racism? And four, what is the biblical reality of racism? Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you a heads up. The next two weeks are going to be hard. It's going to be some of the hardest preaching I've ever done. I want you to be here for it. I want you to hear it in its context. Now, to begin with, this is pretty straightforward. In fact, I sent out a word for today this past week, which probably should have been a word for the week because that was the only one I got out. <laughs> But nevertheless, it dealt with Acts chapter 17, verse 26, where it tells us very clearly that God created what? All people from one. Who's the one? Adam. That's pretty clear, right? That's where everybody comes from. We all know that. We read our Bibles. We know what Scripture says. So what is the biblical view of race? Before Darwin, race primarily had to do with political and geographical areas, but then as Darwin and evolutionary systems began to take hold and people began to embrace that ideology and that false heresy, they began to see that race, or were believing that race had to do with lower races and higher races and black races and white races and red races. But scientifically and biologically, there's only one race, and scientists know this now. They know it very clearly. In fact, scientists today agree that there's really only one biological race, singular, of humans. As the article said that I read this past week, geneticists have found that if we were to take any two people from anywhere in the world, the basic gen genetic differences between these two people would be typically around 0.2%. Not even 1%, but just 0.2%. It went on to say, racial characteristics account for only 6% of that 0.2%. In other words, if you take a group of white people or a group of black people, the variations within that group are more than the actual differences between black and white. Because you got some people with a big nose like me. you got some people who have different heights, different hair colors, all within one group of white people, or the same is the case with black people. But between black and white, the percentage literally comes down to 0.012% difference. That's like one one hundredth of a percent is the difference between me, my Asian brother or sister, my black brother or sister. It's so minuscule. And really, we all know this. I mean, the dis discussions that's been out there for so long, it's just a, the difference between how much melanin you have in your what? Your skin, Right. All of us are all one color. We're just different shades of the same color. That's it. That's what the scripture teaches. That's what it affirms. There's no, no difference whatsoever between the human race. We're all one. As this author went on to say, the only reason many people think there's differences are, are major is because they've been brought up in a culture that teaches this reality. Listen, I was raised in that culture. I understand that thinking. I know where it comes from. It doesn't come from God's word. It comes from a culture of hatred. He went on to say, as a scientist at the American Association and the Advancement of Science Convention in Atlanta in 1997 stated these words, race is a social construct derived mainly from perceptions conditioned by the events recorded in history and is, has no biological basis at all. The American ABC News science page stated, quote, more and more scientists find that the differences that set us apart are cultural, not racial. Some even say that the word race should be abandoned because it's meaningless. We accept the idea of race because it is a convenient way of putting people into broad categories frequently to suppress them. The most hideous example, of course, is Hitler's Germany. 
In 1989, an article written in the Journal of Counseling and Development, researchers argued that the term race is basically meaningless and that it should be discarded. And they're right, because basically when you come to the text of Scripture, you don't find that there. It's not there. What you find is the word ethnos, ethnicity, like you have here in Acts chapter 17. And remember what I read there in verse 26, that it says, and God made from one. God made from one blood. God made from one. That is Adam. He created everyone. You actually have the contrast. He made from one every. That's the idea. Very stark contrast. He made from one every. Every what? Every ethnos. Not every race. Every ethnos. We're all of the Adamic race. We're all of the human race. We're all made in the image of God, every single person. In fact, you read a little later on in that same text in Acts chapter 17, and you find in verse 29, Paul repeats actually a statement from some of the secular authors of that day. And he says in verse 29, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, the word offspring is the Greek word genos. It means kind, the kind or it has, has been translated stock or sort or species. And what you find flavored in that word is the idea that we're all in the image of God. We're all in the image of God. All nations. You have that same word used over in Matthew 28 where it says that we are to go and make disciples of all ethnos. Not all races, but all ethnic groups. That's what he's talking about. Missionaries understand this. They use the term people groups, not races. Because they know that the people groups are divided up culturally and geographically and politically and by language and region. You find that even in scripture. When you turn to Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 it says, After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one can number of all ethnic groups. The word nations is there. Tribes, which basically be, means people of the same lineage. And then peoples, which is a general term for crowds. Laos, laity, and then the word tongues, which is the word glossolalia for languages. And the Bible even sees us divided up as ethnot group, ethnos, yeah, and tribes, and peoples and tongues. We're all one group. And when we get to heaven, there's all going to be one people. It's called the people of God. The people of God. There literally is no difference between the races as far as humanity is concerned. It is a created thing out of the heart of evil men to oppress others and to do harm and hatred to others. Genesis 3.20 says Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living people. All living people. Genesis 9.19 says these three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. We all come from Noah's three sons, which they all came from Adam and Eve. It all goes back. Malachi 2.10 says, Have we not all one father? Not talking about spiritual fathers, talking about human father. I mean the father of humanity. He says, Has not one God created us? Listen, the church needs to take the lead on this and, stay, and say these things and get this stuff out so people can know what the Bible says about this. I close with the last verse. I don't have time to go into any more this morning, but next time we'll go into more detail on these last three points. Let me reread the emphatic statement of Scripture. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And he, God, has made, created, from one, clearly Adam, every ethnic group. Black, white, red, yellow, light brown, dark brown, whatever it is. doesn't matter. All of them. And God made them to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times, when they live and where they live, the boundaries of their dwellings. Can't get any clearer than that. Amen? Let's close in prayer this morning.